okay, you see that um, 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 the seminar start today. The speaker is Bogdan Stankov. He is from Lyon, but um, he's Bulgarian. Yeah. And the title is exact values as exponential formula functions and the, the Coulomb and South of cost inequality, please. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. So in order to present what we would like to talk about, I would first like to give some introduction on the context because I know that we come from various places in algebra. So for the groups I'll be interested in today are um, discrete. So there is uh, each point is separate from the other. There is no interesting topology behind them. And uh, they will also be uh, countable, usually infinite countable. Although uh, what uh, most of what they say will work uh, just the same for finite groups. And uh, for the most of the talk, uh, the groups you work with are finitely generated. Uh, I'll explain why that's not an issue in a second. And uh, in order to talk about uh, Fionner, uh, Fionner functions, uh, I have to first talk about amenability. Um, the origins of the concept of amenability can be found in the um, uh, 1924 uh, article by Van Achtarsky where they uh, take uh, the ball in uh, R3 and cut it into a finite number of pieces. Then with just rotations and translations, obtain uh, two balls, both equal to the uh, ball of the same size as the original unit ball, which is uh, called uh, the Banach-Tarski paradox or the kosdorf banach tarski paradox because there were so their work in that article was heavily influenced by a previous um, work by uh, Kosdorf. Uh, and well, it's not real. It's a paradox in the sense that um, it is counter, it's, it's counterintuitive to the concept of volume, that you can cut the unit ball into a finite number of pieces and make two balls out of it. But uh, it's also, well, it's not exactly a paradox. It just shows that you cannot really define uh, any meaningful measure on uh, all subsets of R3 that you have to decide which subsets to measurable or not. And uh, so in order to define the amenability then on groups, uh, we, in order to define the amenability, then we, we will construct something like a measure we we will call it a mean and uh, what we ask of it that it has to be refined on all subsets it has to be uh, of a total uh, volume uh, one and uh, you want it to be a fi just finitely additive uh, not necessarily accountably additive like most measures for means uh, we ask only uh, finite uh, additiveness and uh, we will have uh, some group uh, that uh, the action of each group preserves uh, the, this mean. And so we immediately see that uh, the, the existence of a mean makes such a paradox impossible. And uh, the opposite has been proven to that uh, I, I can show that uh, 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 the, that such a paradox exists if and only if there is no invariant mean. And so we say that the group is amenable when there exists an uh, invariant mean on the group for the action of the group on itself by no multiplication. Now you might be wondering why are we uh, working on the group? And I'll explain that very soon on the next slide. But before that, uh, I just wanted to give some um, uh, uh, the general properties of amenability it is stable by uh, passing to uh, subgroups and quotients, and it is also uh, stable by uh, extension of a um, amenable group by amenable group, and it is also stable by increasing countable union. Uh, this is particular interest to us because it means that. Uh, a group is amenable if and only if all of its uh, finitely generated subgroups are amenable. So for countable groups, uh, we are safe to assume that they are um, finitely generated. 
Now, why are we, uh, in order to explain why we look at it as a group property, I would like to mention again uh, how uh, the proof of uh, Van Aken Tarski works. Uh, so, to do that, uh, we will find a free group of rotations. And what is a free group? A free group is a group on which um, all um, all relations, the only relations that are equal to the identity in that group are the relations that have to be equal to the identity in every group. Uh, it can be represented as uh, given a fixed set of generators as all words on those generators that do not contain a generator and its inverse uh, side by side. And uh, on uh, on a free, if you take a free group acting on itself, you can uh, you can show a uh, quite easily uh, paradoxical decomposition. So we take here the words starting by A, by A minus one, by B, by B minus one. And we notice that if we multiply this by A minus one, we get all of this. So this is a paradoxical decomposition because we get, you can get uh, the core group as uh, this set plus, no, sorry, this set plus A times this set, this set and this set plus b times this set and there are ways to take care of the identity which is in neither of those sets though i'm not going to get in those either but the basic um, approach of banach and tarski is to uh, find a group of rotations in r3 which is a free group on uh, two rotations in r3 which form a free group a free non abelian group and um, to then uh, th then you they obtain that uh, almost all uh, points uh, all points except for a countable number on the sphere uh, will be um, contained will have an orbit that resembles exactly this scaly graph and you can do a decompose on all of those orbits you can do a paradoxical decomposition and then uh, they take a fifth element which allows them to hide the, the those countable number of points so that allows uh, to to do a paradoxical composition on the sphere and then by race this goes to the ball without the uh without zero and then zero you can also hide uh, relatively easily and uh, so we notice that this is essentially uh uh, the property which allows for this to happen is the presence of this uh, uh, non-abelian free group and the fact that it uh, that it acts uh, really on most of the ball and uh, that's why uh, we think of it as mostly a, a group property and so we get uh, first um, a first example that uh, any group uh, with a free with a free subgroup is non amenable and as it turns out uh, describing a group um, a non amenable group without a free subgroup is pretty difficult the first uh, uh, such results is by Oshansky in uh, 1980 uh, i recall that the banachtarsky article is from 1924 right uh so there, with that uh, now i uh, i'll take it as an introduction to amenability and i move on to one criterion for amenability which is the Fjellner criterion uh, which states that the group is amenable if and only if uh, for any finite set and any epsilon you can find some other finite set that is uh, moved only by epsilon uh by this uh by e which is to say uh in terms of the symmetric difference will be uh, epsilon times smaller than f uh, so first you know i'll make this slide less confusing by immediately saying that if uh, the group is finally generated it will be uh, the situation we could which consider from now on we can always take e equals to some fixed finite generating set Obviously, any other any finite set E will then be contained in some power of S, and then up to uh, replacing uh, epsilon with something smaller. It's uh, just having it for uh, S and any epsilon, we will have it for E and any epsilon. 
uh, and uh, and so we have uh, the condition that uh, uh, for any epsilon we can find a set which by the generators of the group is moved to the distance at most epsilon in terms of, in terms of normalized symmetric difference and uh, in this case we will call f a uh, Fellner set this of course means nothing by itself because it has to depend on some epsilon if epsilon is large enough any set could be an F a Fellner set uh, but is, this is just uh, something we usually say uh, more, spe more specific notation would be uh, to take a sequence of Fionner sets such that the associated epsilon converges towards zero and we call it a Fionner sequence. And so for a finely generated group, we can say that it is uh, amenable if and only if it has a Fionner sequence. Mm. Uh, one uh, pretty easy example of a Fionner sequence is uh, to um take a group of so no actually let me first give another easy example uh if we take uh, the group uh, z of the integers with the usual generating set uh then a then any interval on it we will have that uh um, let's say it's the interval a b if you multiply it by one, so we add one, we get, uh, and then the symmetric difference of those two things will be uh, just uh, uh, two points, right? And so this gives us, a, if you make the interval longer, so this, so this gives us, oh, sorry. Uh, here it will give us a uh, two by the length two divided by the length of the interval for epsilon so this is one uh, very simple uh, uh, example of founder sets which we will be interested in actually later it will be useful for us and a bit more generally if we take a group of sub exponential growth we consider the balls in this group uh, then um, the size of those balls, uh, we know that some subsequence of it uh, has to uh, um, uh, has to be a Fionner sequence. We don't. Uh, we, it is actually an open question if uh, we can always take uh, all balls, um, and it is also um, an open question if uh, this is possible for any subsequence of balls. For a group of exponential growth and actually in both cases this is uh, uh, the same question uh, it is it basically uh, boils down to the question of this this sequence always converge so uh, the first question is if we know that uh, uh, this is a first exponential growth there is certainly uh, some subsequence such that it converges to one, but we don't know if the call sequence converges to one. And in the second question, we know that there is some subsequence that is strictly larger than one, but we don't know if uh, if the sequence converges to one once again. Okay. Now um, we would like to represent this uh, on the KD graph. Uh, so imagine. Uh, we now take uh, our for e instead of just the generating set we will take uh, its symmetric and also the identity and so then um, this symmetric difference uh, f e will always contain f and uh, so uh, in the what we see in the symmetric difference is just uh, uh, in our Cayley graph we have some f and uh, uh, the symmetric difference is just the points in the Cayley graph at distance one from it. Mm -hmm. And we will call this the outer boundary because it's on the outside of, um, of our graph, of our um, set F. We can define similarly define the inner boundary. So the inner boundary will be uh, 
the points here at the distance ones from the outside and the edge boundary, which is just the edges between um, the inside of the FF and the outside of FF. And uh, I'll explain why we, should, we consider all those boundaries in a second. Uh, this gives us, um, this, le this lets us uh, define uh, the Fjellner condition directly on the KG graph. That is to say, uh, it, uh, the group will be in the main evolution on leaf. It is a perimetric constant, also known as trigger constant, is uh, on the KG graph is zero. Um, this is just for infinite groups because for finite groups, uh, the definition of the trigger constant uh, um, has need additional conditions. Mm. And with this, we can now define the Fjellner function. Uh, so the basic idea of the Fjellner function is to ask uh, how small can the Fjellner sets be? And uh, it is defined as the minimal size of a set uh, such that uh, it is a Fjellner set for one divided by n. It's the Fjellner function and it's defined on the integers. Although I would like to note it is defined to use the inner boundary instead of the outer boundary, as, uh, which is what arises from the definition. Uh, I think that's just how it happened historically. Uh, and uh, as we seen, we will see in a second that it's um, that for the most of the studies that have been done, it doesn't really matter if you consider which boundary you consider. So I would like to notice that the owner of one is always equal to one because we just take one point and uh, its inner boundary is also that same one point. So we get one by one. We get exactly one for the um, quotient. And then uh, now this of course depends on the generating set. If you change the generating set, uh, then uh, the function is preserved to asymptotic equivalence. And asymptotic equivalence is uh, an equivalence that allows us to also multiply by a constant in the argument. Uh, in particular, uh, I would like to notice that uh, those two functions are always asymptotically equivalent, uh, no matter what, uh, even if alpha and beta, well, assuming that both alpha and beta are strictly larger than zero, of course. Uh, if we put uh, a power on uh, on n here, then it will, they will no longer be asymptotically equivalent, but just for, uh, um, but uh, there's still a very large class of uh, various functions that are asymptotically equivalent to each other which we don't really like. Uh, uh, so why the, coming back to why this uh, doesn't, uh, it matter which boundary we choose, that is because uh, there will always be asymptotic equivalence. Uh, there is a very direct relation with that uh, each edge in the edge boundary is of course connected to something in the inner boundary and something in the outer boundary. So we all immediately have those two inequalities. But then each point in the inner and outer boundary is connected, uh, has at most two s, even at most two s minus one edges connecting it to uh, uh, respectively to the inside of the outside of f. So we have those inequalities too. So uh, we have that uh, all of those, all three of those boundaries are uh, up to some fixed constant, the same, and uh, up to a sympathetic equivalence, they will give the same Fjellner function. Uh, so it doesn't matter which boundary we choose here, it's just that classically with it's uh, it's defined using the inner boundary. Um, uh, so uh, in a bit I'll talk about uh, what is known about the other functions, but first uh, uh, a lot of the examples which we'll be working on will be uh, red products, so I'd like to introduce uh, that. Um, so for um, Consider two groups A and B, uh, and uh, consider the functions from A into B. We will say that uh, their support is uh, uh, it's a very natural definition, the points where uh, uh, the image of the function is not the identity. And so, and now we want to consider functions 
will denote like this functions with finite support. So we did now we can define the red prompt per A and B. Uh, it is sometimes this is a question of convention. Sometimes it's written with uh, the active group on the right. I write it with the active group on the left because it's uh, or there's a, because it acts. Uh, we, we, for group actions, we usually write them on the left. Uh, and so it is defined as the semi-direct product of A on the space of uh, functions with finite support from A to B. And uh, the action that defines the semi-direct product is the action by uh, translations on the argument. And uh, uh, so in other words, each element is written uh, as a, a pair of uh, point in A and point in uh, this space which is denote f as new function. And uh, this is the product. So we have, uh, we just multiply on the first coordinate and the second coordinate, we have f and then we have f prime, which a has acted on uh, by translation. So it's this one. Uh, and to give an example, let us uh, present, let us um, consider the lamp lighter group of, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, z adding what uh, z by uh, two z, one of the simplest, one of the simpler uh, red, red process you can consider, and we have a generating set made of uh, one and uh, the zero function, which is so with the, just the um, movement on the first coordinate and uh, zero and uh, delta function, which gives one at zero and otherwise uh, nothing. Um, and so in order to understand that, let us look again at the product that we had here. Mm, and so take AF and you multiply it on the right by one zero function. What does that give? So uh, this is it's, 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 uh, uh, both of those groups I will be uh, thinking of as additive groups. So we get a plus one here. Oh, sorry. And then um, for the second coordinate, f plus the zero function translated by a, but uh, zero function if you translate it is still zero. So we just get f. So we just move on the first coordinate. And then we should take the other thing. Mm -hmm. It gives us on the first coordinate a plus zero, so we'll just a and the second at f plus this delta function translated by a will give us delta on a. So we have just changed the value of f at the point a, and that's all we, we have done. And so if we look at it uh, here, so we imagine we have this z. And uh, the reason why it's called lamp lighter group because you can imagine it as there is uh, a lamp lighter who the, we have a lamp at each, at each integer point and we have a lamp lighter who moves around and the first coordinate tells us uh, where uh, said lamp lighter is at any given point of time and the second coordinate gives us which lamps are lit and there's a finite number of lit lamps. At, at each step, uh, they can decide to go to the right, which is multiplication by this, or to the left, which is multiplication by the inverse of this, or uh, they can uh, change the value of the, they can change the state of the lamp that they are at, which is the first multiplication by this. Um, and the, yeah, so, so this is the more simple example of a red product. Uh, more you can uh, this can be the more generally for all red products uh, you can uh, one can think of them as uh, lamps on the uh, on the set a a movement by a by generators of a and then uh, the states of the lamps are not just two states on and off but are uh, characterized by the whole group b but it's fundamentally the same idea and it has uh, similarly a standard generating set which is uh, uh, one considers all of the possible ways to move on A while, while with identity on B. So just movement on the 
which plays uh, one is among the lumps, and then also identity on A and uh, any generator on B, uh, a delta which gives uh, any generator on B at the identity of A, which is just changing the lump by this generator, and this allows us to move to all possible states of the lumps. There are also, uh, you also get uh, standard uh, Fjolnir sets, which are just, um, uh, could, uh, so having Fjolnir sets on A and B, we can define the standard Fjolnir sets such where uh, the, our place in the lumps is contained in uh, uh, FA. Uh, the support of F is also contained in um, FA and the image of F is contained in FB. And um, so imagine if you, if you have some uh, AF and you multiply it by uh, one of those generators. Uh, and you assume that you are not in uh, this, uh, this Fjolnir set F. Uh, well, you haven't changed the, the function. So the condition on the functions are still verified. So that means that uh, AS is not in FA. And uh, similarly, if you uh, uh, take something like this and you multiply it by uh, the second uh, type of generator, uh, well, uh, the support of F, uh, well, your A is in FA. So uh, the, you, you cannot have uh, changed this condition. You cannot have added something to the support outside the FA of A because this is a delta. It only changes at the point A, which is in FA. So uh, the image you must have changed to be outside of F. You must have changed the image of F, which means that uh, F of A times S prime is not in uh, FB. So you must, uh, in in either case, you must be in uh, one of the, either A or F of A respectively is in the bound, is in the inner boundary of um, F A or F B respectively. Uh, and this gives you, and one of things that uh, this is there for a Fjolnir set for, um, uh, for the lamp light, for this uh, red product. And this gives us an upper bound on the Fjolnir function of a red product, which is uh, essentially Fjolnir uh, on B to the power Fjolnir of A up to asymptotic. Well, it, it's this, but up to asymptotic equivalence, it's just Fjolnir B to the power Fjolnir A. Okay, now, uh, now that you have this, um, I would like to talk a bit about uh, what is already known on uh, Fjolnir functions. So the first results are, um, mm, quite out on Rn. So first on R2, I think Steiner shows that uh, in terms of ideal perimetry on the plane, shows that uh, if, uh, uh, now this is in the continuous setting, uh, he shows that if a set has a um, minimal boundary for a fixed size, um, uh, then it must be a, a ball. But uh, the, the, he doesn't, uh, that doesn't finish the proof because he doesn't yet show that there is a set with minimal boundary. And then Schwartz finishes this and shows that uh, I think on R2 and R3 that uh, the balls are, in, are indeed uh, sets with uh, minimal boundary. And this, since uh, Rn is quasi very uh, because it's metric to Zn, so up to asymptotic equivalence, it also really gives us the result on uh, on Zn as well. Uh, then later, Verhoeven obtains it for direct products. Uh, per can see for um, H for Heisenberg group H three. And then um, the next result, uh, which will interest us, the clones of cost inequality. So. Um, uh, so this here is the volume function. This is the number of uh, points uh, in the ball of uh, radius n. And so uh, P is uh, the inverse of the volume function. And concept of cost obtained that the boundary of a set is, all, you know, is, control, is always 
at least uh, some constant time uh, phi of uh, 2f. So this, uh, this gives us a lower bound on the Fiona function based on, um, on volume growth. Uh, in particular, that shows us that if um, the group has uh, uh, exponential growth, that the Fiona function must be at least exponential. If it has uh, super polynomial growth, the uh, Fionner has to be super polynomial. So in particular, if the Fionner function is polynomial, that implies polynomial growth, which means that uh, the group is uh, virtually neopotent. And if the group is virtually neopotent, it's not hard to see that it has a polynomial Fionner function. So uh, the polynomial case is solved. It's uh, is the same as uh, volume growth. It's uh, groups with, that are virtually neopotent. Uh, however, unlike volume growth, it is not known if there is an intermediate a group with intermediate Fauner function, that is to say uh, super polynomial, but uh, sub-exponential. Uh, the classic example of a group with uh, intermediate volume growth is uh, the first Grigorchuk group. Uh, for it, it is known that the Fauner function on that group is exponential. But there might be some other uh, group uh, where the Fiona function is intermediate, which would immediately, yeah, it, it, it will, of course, also have to have intermediate volume growth. Uh, later on, uh, the, the constants in this uh, inequality have been improved later on. So here we have one by eight, uh, we have one divided by eight times s, then. Uh, uh, separately in a book and in an article one can find uh, uh, one divided by two as the constant here and then in the more recent work uh, Santos Correa and Trajano obtain uh, uh, one minus epsilon um, which uh, is also obtained uh, by um, um, Christoph Pitet and uh, myself uh, in a different article that uh, I'll be talking about later uh now uh and i'll and i'll also explain why i'm focusing on this constant and not, th not thinking about this one there's actually a reason why we do that mm -hmm. other so other results uh, they, so this is uh, now those are very recent results i've kind of jumping in time those are recent results but uh, the next thing after the current of cost inequality historically would be uh uh, when Verfi casts if Fiona's function can be super exponential, which is kind of what uh, starts uh, uh, creates more interest in uh, studying Fiona's functions. Uh, Peter obtains that it's uh, not the case for polycyclic groups. And then uh, a bit later, the first uh, result is by uh, Peter and Sal, of course. They obtain uh, that the Fiona function is super exponential for. Uh, direct product of ZD and Z by 2Z for uh, D at least three. Uh, then later, Anna Erschler, uh, who is uh, my uh, thesis uh, director, uh, shows that the earlier inequality we obtained is up to, up to asymptotic equivalence almost always. Well, it might, uh, is, it is equality up to asymptotic equivalence if we assume some form of regularity on the groups, but the regularity condition is very weak and uh, I do not know of a group that doesn't verify it. So we can think of it as pretty much always, if not always true. And so in particular for uh, this, uh, it, uh, she shows that this is super exponential for the at least two already. So this will already, will always be exponential n to the power d. And then, uh, well, without getting into too much detail, there uh, later uh, in later works, people have obtained uh, results for uh, given a class of function, uh, given some type of function, there is a group uh, that has uh, this function as its owner function at the synthetic events. So results by Grumov, so of course, the chain and chain, uh, Bruce and chain, uh, Ashley and chain. And uh, with this, we now get to um, my work. So my work comes from the idea that, uh, um, well, group, we, we know a lot about uh, Fionnet functions, the plus equivalence, 
However, asymptotic equivalence is not very nice to work with because all exponential functions are asymptotically equivalent to each other. So not it is too general, uh, it doesn't give us good results. So I tried to, so I tried studying uh, the exact values of the functions. And so let's uh, we will say that the set is optimal if it uh, minimizes uh, the quotient of the boundary for its given size. And that you also cannot obtain the same uh, quotient for a smaller size. And so um, we now consider um, a red product of uh, Z on some finite group D. And we will take uh, as a generating set the movements on uh, Z, so right and left movement, and then delta E for all possible E in D that are not zero. Uh, I would like to note here that, um, well, better not the identity. Sorry. I would like to note that the, that the um, with this generating set, the group structure of D doesn't play any role because for the study of Fiona sets and volume growth and stuff like that, because you can move from any point of D to any other point of D with the, with the generating element. And so we obtain that uh, the standard sets, which I mentioned earlier, are optimal for the outer boundary. Uh, I would like to, well, just let me stop for a second. The standard sets here uh, are just uh, an interval on Z, and for D, we'll take the whole D. So it's just an interval, and the A, both A and the spot are F are contained in the interval. And so we obtain that the stand, standard sets are optimal, uh, except uh, starting at a certain size. And for the outer boundary, though. And then uh, from that, uh, and also they are the unique optimal sets of to, to translation of their size. And so for the inner boundary, it falls, one can show, well, it's not immediate, but we can show that it falls that uh, uh, a set like this. So uh, the, the set FN uh, reunion, its outer boundary will be optimal for the inner boundary. And this gives us the exact value of the Fiona function, which is uh, this one. Mm. All right. And now, um, having this, let's um, let's return to the columns of cost inequality. Uh, so, in my in my joint work with um, uh, Christophe Pitet, we define uh, a constant like this, which is the uh, the supremum of the constant that one can put here in front of the thing in the columnar side of cost inequality in order to still obtain, in order for that inequality to still be true, and it will be for a given group and a given generating set. And what we obtain, the reason why we define it like this, because we obtain that uh, this constant is actually the quotient of the exponents of the Fiona function and the volume growth function. Um, uh, so here I would like to notice that the limit uh, the the expand of the, this limit always exists because uh, the volume function is uh, submultiplicative. Uh, any word of length n plus n can always be written as a word of length m times a word of length n. Uh, however, the same is not true for the Fiona function. Um, well, already for super exponential. Uh, uh, Fionnage functions, this will diverge towards infinity. But even if we assume that diverging towards infinity, if, even if the data conversion that it is converging towards infinity, this would still not be a limit because there are functions that oscillate between a finite number and infinity. And it is actually, we actually use the a function um, from, um, from the article of Hesler and Chenk that shows us that there are such functions that oscillate between a finite number and infinity. So uh, this is this is uh, this has to be uh, taken as a uh, lower uh, limit, and it can never be a, a, a real limit. And so uh, the earlier results by um, uh, Bruno Santos Croye and Trajanov will give us that because it's true for every lambda. We obtain that uh, this is, uh, and which we really prove in our article as well. We obtain that this is at least one. 
Well, if we substitute for the standard generating set, uh, we obtain uh, something like this, which is actually, which then, as it turns out, doesn't help us a lot because it's rather large. And there is actually another uh, generating set, the switch, rock, switch set, for which uh, this constant is uh, at most two. Uh, it might be lower, but we don't expect it to be. Uh, the switch rock switch sets, it is just the set uh, which, uh, it is just a set on the um, lamp lighter group for which uh, lighting, the lighting or uh, turning off the lamp is a free action. And for it, uh, the standard generating sets will give us um, a quotient of two here, but we don't know. There might be, bad. theoretically, there could be um, uh, other Fionner sets in there that pre perform even better, but uh, we don't know them. For now, what, what we know is that this constant for all uh, G and S is, con is, between, uh, is at least one, and uh, there are groups for which it is at most two. Uh, the optimal value of this constant is therefore still uh, still an open question, somewhere between one and two. And um, another thing uh, that you can do with uh, exact values of the Fionnage function uh, is uh, to consider this, uh, those power series. So uh, to give a bit of background, those power, similar power series have been considered for the um, volume growth function and have been shown uh, for certain classes of groups and generating sets that uh, those power series for the volume growth will give um, a rational function. And the way in which this is obtained comes from, uh, <coughs> um, comes from certain algebraic properties on the group, such as uh, something like um, finite uh, number of column types or something like that. Uh, whereas here we obtain um, some function that, well, we, uh, uh, well, sorry, I didn't really mention it. This is, here we have the result for the exact values only for n larger or equal than the size of D. So if, if D is uh, just uh, of size two, this gives us all values because you know if you only have one, but otherwise there are some unknown values, but that's just a polynomial, so it doesn't play on the rationality. But in either case, uh, here we obtain a rational function, but it is only by calculating it, having the exact values of the Fionnier function. And it would be interesting to have an algebraic reasoning for why this function is uh, rational. Uh, I'll skip this slide because we don't have a lot of time, I think. And I'll just uh, say a few words on the, um, on the proof. Uh, so the idea of the proof is to have uh, to work on an associated graph where um, uh, to each point, uh, to each element in our group, we will uh, associate, which is just the, those are, we, we will just consider the functions of z into d. And um, each point of our uh, group, uh, each element of our group, uh, which we will think of it as the set of edges. Uh, so a, a point that is AF, we will think of it as the, uh, we will associate it the set of edges that will go out from F and change only on the coordinate A. And uh, the point of this is that uh, it allows us to study, to see, to look at um, more easily at uh, points in the outer boundary, because a point in the outer boundary, it either has to have uh, an edge like this, which uh, goes, uh, the end of which is not in the group. Um, so it will be a leaf in our graph or, um, yeah, or it has to be a movement on the translation on Z and this will be a translation on Z. Uh, uh, we will just move us, we will give us two points in the boundary for each, uh, uh, for each different uh, function that can be found uh, as the second coordinate in our set. So this, I said, this gives us um, there's a, I'm, I, I'm hiding some things because I'm like going right pretty quickly, but uh, we ultimately obtain that this is uh, leaves 
the, the sum of leaves in the associated subgraph plus two times the numbers of uh, uh, vertices that are not leaves. So this gives us this, and we can show that uh, having leaves is not optimal, and we obtain uh, some sort of inequality, which turns out to be equality for the standard sets, and this proves that the standard sets are optimal for the outer boundary. And uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for the speaker. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, excuse me. Uh, I have a uh, next question. Um, are the uh, criterions uh, of the amenability or <clears throat> non amenability in the framework of direct or uh, inverse limits? Uh, re uh, repeat, please. The criterions of amenability in the framework of uh, direct or inverse limits is are uh, the criterions. Um. Имали критерии за мобилити, за директните произведения и за обратните и за границите на директния мит, което се казва. Ah, you mean for direct products of groups? Uh, inverse on direct limits of sets of groups, uh, and ability to connect mm. with sets and with groups. Mm. Oh, well, yeah, the, the, so in particular, an extension of an amenable group by an amenable group is amenable. So any direct product of amenable groups will be amenable. Is that uh, okay? Uh, thank you. But I, I, I'm asking about uh, direct or inverse limits, yeah. projective or injective limits yes. of sets or, or, or groups. For instance, the uh, periodic group, uh, periodic ring. This is the uh, inverse or projective limit of uh, finite groups. Uh, um, not really. Hmm. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. And F F two. This is non and non yeah, this is non abelian yeah. group f2 yeah it's it's non abelian and non -abelian. Ah, yeah thank you thank you so i'm i'm not sure if there is a criterion with uh, direct or inverse limits some i think that in some cases it will be contained in the increasing countable union condition but uh, as a general case, I'm not sure if there is uh, something that is a direct uh, that directly works on the on such a unit. Uh, at least, uh, yeah, I, I cannot think of uh, such a criteria. Okay, thank you. Some other questions. It was not a question, it was a problem to solve, maybe. <laughs> yeah. If no other questions, yes, thank the speaker once again. The next Friday, this is um, um, a holiday in Bulgaria, so there will be no seminar. But after this, if there are some um, 
the seminarity will be announced in time. Now I think that we should stop recording and we have simply some chat.